Now, would you believe the Nomad was originally a 1954 Corvette prototype? It debuted at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City for the General Motors Motorama. It was such a huge success that some of its features were actually applied to the Chevy Bel Air two-door station wagon. In 1955, Chevrolet put this model into production as the Nomad, producing 8,530 in the Nomad's inaugural year. Along with its ribbed roof and tailgate, their slanted B-pillars, you can spot the 55 Nomad by its unique headlight eyebrows, the fender and door spears, and a waffle pattern interior design. This moment in history is brought to you by Federated Auto Parts. Yeah! Nice, man. Yeah, man. Cool, hey, welcome back. Willie just rolled in a 1955 Bel Air Nomad Wagon. Man, I've been checking out the pictures, trying to zoom in and look at stuff. But yeah, I'll tell you this. When I saw the picture, I was pretty excited. When I saw the car, I was like, Ugh, it's reality a little, set in. It's a little rougher. Here's the deal. I'm thinking about picking up this Nomad. You know I've wanted one for a long time. Right now, he's got a 24K price tag on it. Spendy. Yeah, I know these things came with, what, 265 cubic inch motors. Yeah. So not real powerful. No. So there are probably a lot of engine swaps out there. There's a lot of restorations because they're so old so there's a lot yeah. of things to look for you know when we're looking at this thing yeah and that's what we plan on doing man is dive into this car see if it's worthy of me purchasing it and give you some tips on how to shop for your next hot rod yes yeah, so we're gonna grab some tools get this thing on the lift start diving in all right well i've got pulse but i've got a really bad paint job so maybe this will come in handy later on but you can see right up here, we've got some checking going on, some cracks. And that's going on pretty much everywhere across this car. I've got big cracks here. And if I look down here, you really get down and you kind of look at the light. I've got a lot of, I mean, tiny little blistering and things going on. It looks like trash in the paint, but it's more likely the lacquer underneath whatever's been sprayed on top coming through. So the entire paint job on this thing, although from you know, 25, 50 feet away, looks great. Up close, it's dead. It's gonna to have to pretty much go down to metal. So that's, that's a huge decision point. Do I want something to look good for a while or am I ready to do a restoration? I've got some scratches. Now light scratches you can probably polish out, but heavy scratches you're either gonna live with or you're gonna to have to find glass. Now sometimes it's hard to find glass depending on the car. This chrome piece right here fits pretty good, but as I get over here, it sort of sticks out. I've got a pretty big gap. So if I follow that along and I do a little CSI, right, this door is starting to look pretty funky. I've got a huge ledge here, fits okay, and then a high spot. So either this door's been hit, maybe the front end, or what looks like there might be some funny action going on in the quarter panel. Okay, kind of alluding to what Kevin was saying, at the front of the car, you see signs of the very same in the back, either an impact or a lot of rust and somebody did a repatch. Now here you see a weld or some sort of seam here coming through, another seam right here. And this, if you do the old knock test for Bondo, you can hear that's metal, but you get down in here more of the thug and you get to feeling a lot of Bondo. You can detect that just by a simple big difference there. There's a lot of places online that have different articles and so forth. We go to myclassicgarage.com. The reason being, not only are there tech articles, there's forums, there's guys mid-process of restoration just like this, regardless of how rare the car is. But there's also places and companies that you can go there and get new quarter panels, new interior parts, new fenders, and so forth. So check it out if you're in the process of a restoration, myclassicgarage.com. It'll help us find a lot of these hard to get parts. I think the next step for us to do really, now that we know what's going on on the outside of this car, is to get under the hood, right? See if there's anything that lights our fuse right there, since we know what we're dealing with on the outside. Now the paint and the body might have been a little bit rough, but there's a lot of great work under the hood. So that's a positive sign. Yeah. So we've got sort of a new crate motor in here. So modern, probably 350. So it looks like a ZZ4 motor, Nice. right? A lot of new stuff with it, headers wires, right, ignition system. So even the AC, all the lines look brand new. I mean, that's, that's good stuff. Now we're gonna do an overall inspection of the health of this motor. That means pulling the plug, which I believe you got right there. Yeah. How'd that look? Well, it looks pretty fresh. So we're hoping this thing has pretty low miles on it and yeah. good compression. Yeah, we're gonna do a compression check. Now when we come back, that's a great way to tell you basically the overall health of the motor, how those cylinders are firing, how they're sealing up and so forth. Yeah, so we're gonna take a break. When we come back, it's gonna keep on diving in. Yeah. Hey, welcome back. Now we've got our 55 Chevy Nomad. Mm. Willie's got K 
cash in his pocket, <laughs> burn a hole. He's thinking about buying this thing. But yeah, we want to check it out first. Amen. Yeah. And that means checking out the health of the motor. One of the great ways to do that is with a compression test. Yeah, because we all know you need three things, compression, fuel, and spark. So compression is important because it's one of the most expensive and hardest things if it's not there. Yeah. So we're going to see how much pressure our cylinders can make when we turn the engine over. Now, a couple things you want to do before you actually start doing that compression test. You want to unhook the ignition, okay? If you have fuel injection, all right, you want to unplug those injectors as well. We've removed all the plugs. We've threaded our hose to the compression line inside that spark plug hose, and we take it from each cylinder and test the compression of each cylinder. Now, I've got a simple piece of paper labeled one through eight. We'll jot down the numbers that it gives us. What you're looking for is big fluctuation in those numbers. All right, man, we got about 215. That's, nice. that's a That's a pretty strong. good number, yeah. I can release the pressure here. We can move on. Now, what you're looking for is there's no like pass or fail number. You know, a manufacturer might give you a range, which is good, so that you want them all to be about the same. So what you're looking for is a low flyer, you know, or multiple low flyers. So you're seeing 215, 210, 27, 220, and then you get a 160, 120. You know you probably got a problem in that cylinder. Now it's going to change depending on you know compression ratio of the engine. Even your cam can change this number. So again, it's all about consistency. So we're going to run through, do all eight, see what we got. All right, we made some good progress on our motor with our compression test, and you can see all the numbers are really good and really tight. So it means the motor is running pretty strong and it's pretty fresh. Yeah. But for you guys at home, if you were to get a low baller or two, you can go a little bit further with the leak down test. Yeah, man, a leak down test is really going to tell you what part of the cylinder is failing, all right? Whether it's valves, rings, and so forth. Now, here's how it works, okay? We put it at the top dead center. We chose the easiest cylinder we could, number one, okay? And again, we got a top dead center, got our little hose in here. Basically, just do this, all right? So this is the air coming in. I'm going to do a quick adjustment. Make sure it's at 100 right there. It is. Lock it down. And you can see this cylinder is only leaking about 5%, man. That is really good. That's tight. So yeah. we know this is a pretty fresh crate motor, and that's a great sign. Yeah, that's man. That's some cash we're not spending. Exactly. And another good trick if you're going to do a leak down test is mark the harmonic balancer. And normally, about every 90 degrees, you'll see a little indicator. And that way, you could follow the firing order on a small block Chevy 18436572. Makes doing a leak down test really easy. Yeah, now we go over to whiteboard. We'll show you a little bit about what's actually going on in there and, you know, how to read that gauge so it's not just a number, it's got some meaning to you. So yeah. come on over here. Now, we drew the engine out here. So this is more of a, a four valve, you know, cylinder head setup. So just a little easier. We've got an intake with a valve, an exhaust with a valve, right? We've got our piston here. Now, we said set it at top dead center. So if you think about it, if I'm going to pressurize this cylinder through the spark plug hole, and if my piston and rod are just a little bit cocked over here and I pressurize it, boom, it's just going to push right down. So that's why you got to get it pretty close to TDC. But once you're there, now you're listening for where that air is going. You're leaking. So Willie can go to the exhaust and he can listen, put a stethoscope on there and see if I've got a rushing going on past my exhaust valve that should be closed. I can go to the carburetor side or intake and do the same thing. So I could be leaking past the valves. That might be, you know, worn out guides. So I've got slop, worn out seats, anything in that sealing system. Now the other way I can look is I'm blowing past my rings. Now I've got a ring end gap, so don't let that fool you a little bit. That's a little bit of leakage, but it's controlled. But if I've got a lot, I can pull a dipstick and I can hear leakage going in the crankcase. Now the other thing you can do is you can leak right past the head gasket and go into maybe the water jack. So if you pull the radiator cap, look for bubbles coming out, that's where all that leakage could possibly be going. So we're going to go through some of the other cylinders, you know, if we had a bad motor, but this one's looking pretty good. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to get underneath that car and see what other kind of dirty things we can find. All right, welcome back. Here's the moment of truth, man. We got it up on the lift. Now understand, we've done a full kind of inspection of the body. We got to check out the motor, and the body had me a little bit worried, a little discouraged, yeah. but the motor, hey, couple dude, thumbs up. That thing was strong. That thing's yeah. ready to go, dude. Yeah, man. So you're what, like 50-50 right now? About, you know, I like the car. There's no joke. I've wanted one of these for about a year and a half now, so right now everything seems eh, pretty good. But again, this is the moment that we've all been waiting for, okay? Right, let's get out the inspection yeah. devices, the flashlights and whatnot. Yeah, brakes over here look pretty good. The rotor's brand new, so yeah. definitely a lot of work in this front end. Now, I see some exhaust work from these new headers, 
and it's pretty boogery up here, but you know what? It doesn't have yeah. to look pretty. As long as it holds the gas, it doesn't leak. Check out this drive shaft, man. I mean, I don't know if the angles change by how they installed the motor and the trans, yeah. but we've got a little bit of adjustment here. We're dragging on the whole parking brake linkage here, but that's easily fixable. Uh-oh, here's a showstopper here. Uh-oh. Oh, we got a lot of frame rust. Whoa, a lot of frame Ooh, rust up in here. Man. Ooh, that's not good at all. You follow the trail? How far up that way does it go? Um, the whole oh. frame rail itself is rusted, and I haven't... Oh, no. Oh, man. Oh, no. Are you kidding me, dude? Look at the rust. Is that fiberglass? Dude, that is fiberglass mesh. Did they really try to make oh. a frame rail out of fiberglass? Dude, oh. Oh. dude, I'm so bummed on this car, man. I was hoping it was gonna be the one. It's like a, it's like a no, no, no mad for Willie. <laughs> yeah, so I'm taking it. That's off the list. Yeah, it's definitely 100% off the list, man. Hopefully, you guys learned some tips and some tricks to look for when you're out car shopping. We're out hot rod hunting, right? Unfortunately, this one just had too much decay for us to deal with, man. Yeah, just but the cool thing it. is, it can be down on one side, but it can be fun on the other side. So, good luck to you guys. Yeah. In the meantime, we'll see you next time. Dude, I'm so bummed on that, man. I wanted that to be the car.